Proverbs chapter 7 tonight. Proverbs chapter 7 tonight. And so, Lord, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for allowing us to gather together. We bless you, Lord, that we can come into your presence in praise and in worship, lifting our hearts, our hands, and our voices unto you, Lord God. And you hear our heartfelt cry. You are worthy, Jesus. And again, we thank you for reminding us by saying, hey, welcome in, my good and faithful servant. Well done. What a great reminder, Lord. All this, this temporary world, Lord, is blowing away. It's in the rearview mirror. What's ahead of us? Our heavenly home. And that's what excites us, Lord. This world is full of hardship and trials and tribulations. Of course, there's joy and, and happiness likewise, but Lord, our heart's felt cry is to meet you face to face once and for all and hear those words, well done. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father and Holy Spirit. Encourage us tonight. We need encouragement, Lord. We've been out in the world all week Thank you for inviting us here to become refreshed, to be reminded of your goodness, be reminded how you love us, be reminded how you want to teach us, guide, and provide for us. And we thank you, Lord. Be with Connie and the kids and the being redeemed tonight. Let them have a time of gathering and a time of fellowship. And once again, a reminder of your goodness, Lord. Thank you, Father. Go before us and reveal yourself, and Holy Spirit, teach us tonight. These things we pray in Jesus' name and say, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. As we open up Proverbs chapter 7 tonight, we see, we will find tonight, once again, Solomon addressing the young and the young at heart likewise. Now, do you remember in Proverbs chapter, th chapter 4, verse 3, Solomon reminded us and in, in, in taught us in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 3. Let me just remind us. Solomon writing, When I was my father's son, tender, and the only one in the sight of my mother, he also taught me and said to me, Let your heart retain my words. Keep my commands and live. Get wisdom, get understanding. So we remember in Proverbs chapter 4, Solomon was reminded of his dad, King David's direction. And Solomon now is taking that position of teacher. We remember once again, and just as a reminder, in 1 Chronicles chapter 28, jot it down if you like, but 1 Chronicles chapter 28 verse 9. King David speaking to his son Solomon, Solomon, as for you, my son, know the God of your father. Know, my, know Jehovah God. My son, know the God that I serve, and you serve him, Solomon. Serve him with a loyal heart and with a willing mind. This is dad pouring into his son. And it worked out well because now Solomon is taking that wisdom and teaching the other youngsters. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands all the intent of the thoughts. If you seek him, Solomon, David's counsel was, he will be found by you. When you search for the Lord, he'll be found. King David teaching his son. But if you forsake him, Solomon, he will cast you off forever. This is dad pouring into his son. And now once again, we will find as we pick up in Proverbs chapter 7, verse 1, the exact thing. Solomon, though, now taking the position of teacher, my son. Hey, youngsters, young people, gather around. My kids, my son, keep my words and treasure my commands within you. And so Solomon is demonstrating how he has been taught by his own dad, and now he is returning the favor. What a joy. 
And what a responsibility for you and I, whether we have biological kids or whether we have nieces or nephews or, or neighborhood kids. I mean, when our kids were growing up, Connie allowed our household to be the go-to house. That's where the neighborhood kids would come. And many of you were part of that during certain times when we had Resurrection Week. Uh, she'd put on certain things out in the backyard and, and Christmas and, and Thanksgiving and then just sometimes just some regular goofy days just to meet at the house. But our place was the house where people met, where the neighborhood kids would, frankly, sometimes just kind of get dropped off. You know what I'm saying? But we, didn't, we weren't offended by that. But the households knew, the parents knew that, you know, that motorcycle pastor guy down the road and his good looking wife is a safe place. They got to know us. We were approachable. And so quite often we had kids and Connie was in her element teaching these young people. And that's what Solomon is doing here. Hey. Keep my words, the things that I am offering you, treasure them within you. Hold on to them. He goes on in verse 2, keep my commands and live, my young friends, and my law, keep it as the apple of your eye. You know, the apple of your eye, the middle of your eye. I mean, in other words, when you look out, you see, you have a biblical view, if you will. This poetry that's being written by the wisest man in the world, King Solomon. Oh, bind these things on your fingers, write them on the tablet of your heart. Wow, my son, keep these things as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers and write them on the tablet of your heart. This is pretty intimate stuff. Solomon is saying, hey, be quick. Let it jump out at you quickly during your waking hours. Keep it readily available. My commands, my directions, my words, treasure them. Keep them close. Oh, and say to wisdom, verse four, hey wisdom, you are my sister. So this poetic idea, say to wisdom, you are my sister, and then, and additionally, call understanding your nearest kin. So what do we see here? We see a Siamese twin, if you will. The Holy Spirit gives us lots of what I call Siamese twins. What do we see here is the Siamese twins, twins, wisdom and understanding. They're twins. They're brothers and sisters. They're buddies. They're companions. Say to wisdom and call on understanding. Wisdom and understanding. Solomon is saying, hey, call them your nearest kin. Call them your sister. I mean, let, it be, let, let wisdom and understanding be available to you immediately. Why embrace wisdom and understanding? Why? Well, in this context, Solomon is saying, hey, embrace wisdom and understanding so they may keep you fellas from the immoral woman embrace wisdom and understanding to keep you on the road of righteousness that's why Solomon wants his young listeners to embrace wisdom and understanding that's why to keep you from the immoral woman keep you from the seductress who flatters with her words it's going to be tempting there's temptations all over the place. We ran into a hundred temptations just today. There were times when I used to drive down the 60 freeway and with my son. We had business up and down the 60 freeway. And I'll tell you, past the 57 on the freeway, there was a part of the, 50, uh, the 60 freeway past the 57 that I hated because there were huge billboards and I hated that. I've got my young son in there, and here's this thing just splashed all over the freeway, if you will. Same thing going out to San Bernardino. It's not as bad anymore, but I, I get embarrassed driving with my wife. Heading to Loma Linda VA Hospital, and my wife's with me, and a couple of bulletin boards are there. I, I, I'm embarrassed. I'm sitting there with my sweetie. 
And here's all, there's this nonsense being splashed in our faces. And, and, and it's, it's tough to do. So the seductress flatters. There's temptation everywhere. I just heard the other day, uh, we were up at uh, Fontana with some brothers, and the guy that was teaching said, hey, the first look is free, fellas, but the second one is what costs you. So be careful with that second look. Be careful with that temptation. Temptation is not a sin. It's when we embrace temptation. If we keep the two apart, temptation and sin, if we keep them apart, we're fine. But it's when we embrace that temptation, that's when we get into trouble. So don't, when you're tempted, don't fall apart. Just say, oh, whoa, Lord, please take that out of my head, and he'll be glad to do so and work with you. And, and submit yourself to the Lord and keep the two separate. Keep those two things separate. But the seductress, make no mistake, she flatters with her words. And Solomon then begins to reflect. And he's reflecting for our benefit, both men and women. In verse 6, Solomon reflects. He says, for at the window of my house, I looked through my lattice. I looked through the drapery. And I saw among the simple, I perceived among the youths a young man devoid of understanding. Now the audience that Solomon has are young people, and he's saying, hey, embrace, remember, wisdom and understanding. But yet this young person was devoid of understanding. And I observed this. And the young man in verse 8 was passing along the street near her corner. And the young man took the path to her house in the twilight, yes, in the evening, in the black and dark night. Before Christ, I always liked the time of year that we're in now because it would get dark at four o'clock in the afternoon. And that meant I could go out and begin my outlaw activity much earlier in the day. You understand what I'm saying? Because that's what I lived for. And I liked operating under the cover of darkness. Now it's the exact opposite. I can't wait. What is it, two or three weeks? Who was saying that? I mean, we're going to change our clocks again? And it's going to be light until like 8 o'clock? I love that. I love that. I mean, I can go out and mow the lawn at 7 o'clock. I love it. Instead of turning my headlights on at 4.15. You know what I'm saying? I hate that. <laughs> so I can't wait till the time change comes. Why don't we just leave it alone? Let's pick one or the other and leave it. Isn't that what we just recently voted on? How did that ever, what, are we going to see some results of that or what? Or is it still just too, oh man, we really got to contemplate this, boy. This is a big decision. You know? Turn the clocks back or don't. I don't know. My goodness. <laughs> anyway, so the young man in the black and the dark of night, that's when he's out roaming. That's when he's out clowning around. That's when the seductress says, oh, yeah, this is, this is the time. Yeah. And so Solomon is saying, hey, I saw this young man devoid. He was missing understanding. Solomon's saying, not good. And there, verse 10, a woman met him with the attire of a harlot and secondly, a crafty heart. So she had the appearance and she had the motive. Lethal combination. Men are drawn by the eye. We visually are drawn. And she, knowing this, has the attire of a harlot. Dressed seductively, the indication is here. But yet she's got a crafty heart. I'm going to get what I can get out of this guy. A lot of times financial gain is the motive. Nonetheless, 
the attire of a harlot and yet a crafty heart. She's really in charge. The guy thinks he's in charge. But Solomon is saying, oh no, she's running the show. She's letting you think you're operating. Lethal situation. Oh, she was loud and rebellious. In other words, drawing attention to herself. Her feet would not stay at home. Verse 12, at times she was outside, at times she was in the open square. I mean, she's not embarrassed. People know who she is. She's lurking at every corner. And when she saw this young man devoid of understanding, verse 13, she caught him and kissed him. Oh, she's got his attention now, doesn't she? But he thinks he's running the show. Oh, but her crafty heart said, oh, this is no mistake that I caught you in the crevice here. And I got your full attention. I lured you in with my attire. That was simple. I got this stuff at the thrift store. Big deal. But man, to you, it's everything because you're devoid of understanding. And now when I laid one on you, man, I laid a lip lock on you. You're mine, right? Devoid of understanding. So she caught him and kissed him, and with an impudent, impudent face, she said to him, and this is just amazing. Verse 14, this woman says to this man, I have peace offerings with me. Today I have paid my vows. What does this really mean in a way? Oh, I went to confession today. Yeah. I, know, I used to be in that frame of mind. Oh, I, w I go to confession on Friday night so I can party all weekend. Right? That, that's what this is going on in here. And that's really the method and the demonstration that really my parents and the older folks, my, my friend's parents, oh, we all go to confession, maybe Thursday night, but no later than Friday night. No later than Friday night. Because Saturday is a coming, right? We're going to pot And that's what she's saying to him. I have paid my vows. I'm clean. I'm good. I've got a blank slate. Crazy. We're going to look at this a little more in depth come Sunday as the Lord leads, of course. As the Lord tarries. But... Genesis 39, we remember, you and I, we remember Joseph and Potiphar's wife. Potiphar's wife had an eye for Joseph. It appears that he was a good-looking young man. And yet here, Potiphar's wife is saying, hey, hey, my husband is gone. Come with me. And again, we'll look at this in a little more detail come Sunday. But it's the same idea. Hey, I've paid my peace offerings and they're with me and today I've paid my vows. And that's what Potiphar's wife was indicating. Hey, today's the day. We got the place to ourselves, Joseph. And Joseph said, no way. How would I first of all, how is it that I would first of all sin against my God, number one, but then secondly, how is it that I'd sin against my master? Why would you tempt me in this way? This is wrong, Joseph's saying. And again, we'll look at that a little more come Sunday. So I've paid, I've paid my vows. I'm ready for you, young man devoid of understanding. And so uh, since I've paid my vows, verse 15, I came out to meet you. I've been looking for you. I came out to meet you and diligently to seek your face. And lo and behold, hey, I found you. Just like Solomon, or excuse me, just like King David was saying to his son Solomon, seek the Lord and you'll find him. What's our harlot doing? Hey, I'm seeking a bag of money. I'll find it. It's out there. I sought you diligently and I have found you. 
Oh, furthermore, verse 16, oh, I've spread my bed with tapestry, colored coverings of Egyptian linen. Very seductive. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, my devoid of understanding young friend. Come, let you and I take our fill of love until morning. Let us delight ourselves with love. Oh, and don't worry, verse 19, for my husband is not at home. Just like Potiphar's wife. Hey, the servants are gone. My husband's out running the kingdom. I mean, taking care of business. The coast is clear. And this young harlot is saying, hey, my husband, can you, I mean, this is almost sick. My husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. This is the crafty heart that Solomon's talking about. I mean, this is a disaster. This is absolutely horrible. My husband's gone, and he's gone for a long time. He has taken a bag of money with him and will come home only on the appointed day. Oh, he left Monday and said he'll be back in two weeks. He'll come back in two Mondays from now. I mean, he's gone for two weeks. We got it made. Terrible. And verse 21, with her enticing speech, she caused this young, devoid of understanding man to yield to her. With her flattering lips, she seduced him. He thought he was running the show. He thought he was out looking for a good time, if you will. No, it was her. And she is in control. So immediately, verse 22, this young man went after her just as an ox goes to the slaughter. Now Solomon is being very descriptive. She, he went after her as an ox goes to the slaughter or even as a fool goes to the correction of the stocks. The correction. He went after her until, verse 23, an arrow struck his liver. A, a mortal blow, in other words. That was it. It was over. Oh, he is just as if he was a bird that hastens to the snare, Solomon tells us. He, this devoid of understanding young man is like a bird that hastens to the snare. He did not know it would cost his life. When that little Tweety bird starts dancing around that trap, that little Tweety bird has no idea that that trap is going to capture that animal, that bird. And that's it. There's no escape. Do you ever look at one of those Venus flytrap plants? Those things just fascinate me. As a little kid, I always thought they were the neatest things. They're like, they're like alive. I mean, they're alive in some sense in, in the plant kingdom. But to watch them, you know, you, you see that, that what appears to be kind of like a mouth. And that, little, that mouth is just frozen. And then that bug and that, ant, that little critter comes kind of flying around. And, and then there's some sort of scent that's attractive. Kind of like that bed that's been perfumed. And that attraction and that bug lands right in the middle of that, that Venus flytrap, as you know. And then slowly that cage comes down. And then by the time that little bug realizes that he needs to get out, it's too late. Fascinating plan. Absolutely fascinating. Nothing really dramatic but just slow and consistent. And finally, just traps that little guy and that's it. And that's what Solomon is saying. That's exactly, if you're spending your life thinking that you're partying up or whatever, that Venus flytrap is just closing in. Nothing dramatic. You're just going to be expended and that's it. You're done. 
And it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, isn't it? And that's what we're talking about. As a bird hastens to the snare, he did not know it would cost his life. Remember just last time in, in chapter 6, Solomon was talking about the man that goes to the prostitute. His life is about as worth, is about as worth the worth of a crust of bread. Remember we kind of discussed the bread crust? The bread crust is like the last thing we want. It's worthless. I mean, sometimes some people just... Once they get to the two crushed pieces, they just throw it in the trash can. A lot of people do. Because nobody, it, the crust of the bread to most people is, is worthless. And that's the way the young man devoid of understanding. That's the value of his life. It's like a crust of bread. Not a lot of value. When that's the way we spend our lives. Chasing the harlot. As we conclude verse 24, now therefore, so now that I've painted the picture, my young people before me, therefore listen to me, my children. Solomon just pouring himself into his audience. Listen to me, my children. Pay attention to the words of my mouth. Do not let your heart turn aside to her ways. Young men, do not stray into her paths, the harlot's paths. For she has cast down many wounded, and all who were slain by her were strong men. Solomon is including himself in this to some degree. Solomon has found himself in many times in hot water. Big time. And Solomon is saying, hey, don't do as I've done, but take my teaching, I beg you. Strong men have been slain by this crafty heart. And finally, in conclusion, how could it be any more direct when Solomon closes and says, her house, the harlot's house, is the way to hell descending to the chamber, chambers of death. That's it. Wow. Doesn't get any simpler, but yet doesn't get any more pointed than that, I don't think. We're going to be picking up in this theme as we continue through our Sunday journey in 1 Corinthians. And so read ahead. We'll be in chapter 6. Oh, praise the Lord. If I could ask the worship team to come join me. Words of wisdom. I mean, Solomon addressing the young people. Both the, men and the, the young men and the young women. And he knows that all the folks before him will apply his teaching to their particular scenario. Solomon's not pointing anybody out or calling anybody on the carpet. He's just saying, hey, look. This is the way it is. And now that you've heard these words of wisdom, apply them, Solomon is just saying. Hey, just apply these. You know, we're not writing anybody's name on the chalkboard or anything. But just, hey, take these things. I'm giving you these things because I love you, Solomon is saying. I want to give you this instruction. My father instructed me, and you know what? I wasn't the greatest listener. But thankfully... I came to my senses, just like Nebuchadnezzar. His heart was lifted up, and God said, Oh, okay, take this on for the next seven years. As Nebuchadnezzar lived out in the wilderness, literally like a beast. I mean, the king of Israel now living in the wilderness. For seven years and then the Lord brought him back out of that insanity and the first thing Nebuchadnezzar did was praise and give glory to God so Solomon started out you know he got good instruction but he didn't apply very well and now he's begging his young audience consider these things that I'm freely and desiring to offer to you apply these things into your life and you will be grateful. That's all the Holy Spirit is speaking to us tonight. Hey, 
just apply these things. Both men, women, young, old, whatever. Apply these things and live a peaceful, fruit-filled life. Amen? Praise the Lord. Thank you, Father, so much for your goodness. Thank you for your patience and long-suffering with us, Lord. You hate sin, and yet so often we are just so fully engaged in sin. But yet, Holy Spirit, you convict us. We repent, and we come back to you, Lord. So we thank you once again for your patience, your kindness, and your long-suffering with us individually. Now, Lord, we want to come together with repentant hearts unto you, but yet fellowship with one another. Serve you, Lord God, by blessing one another. Thank you for the opportunity. Jesus, we love you. And we thank you that you loved us first and gave us the wisdom to come and to fall at your feet and ask you to come into our lives. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus, Son of God. Thank you, God the Father, the triune God. Bless, be glorified. Continue to reveal yourself. Bless this body of Christ, Lord. Answer prayer this week, Lord. Blow our minds, I would pray, this week. Let us come back Sunday and just rejoicing, say, man, let me tell you what the Lord has been doing. We, we look forward to that, Lord. But in the meantime, let us enjoy the rest of our evening. And it's in Jesus' name we pray these things and say, Amen. Join us by standing. We've got a, a, an old, new song we're going to teach you. Everybody, Pastor Greg, Calvary Chapel, Harupa Valley. Hey, we're so glad that you've been enjoying the videos, and we just know that God has been touching you and just giving you a blessing through these teachings. But you know, we'd like to give you a challenge. Since this material is available, as you know, you can go to the website and pull these videos down, but we would like to challenge you. Since you're enjoying these teachings on a regular basis, we want to challenge you, why not share these videos. You've got lots of friends on Facebook and so forth and social media. Why not inject the gospel message, the Bible teachings of, of the Lord into, into your share partners? It would be a great opportunity to maybe start a conversation, but we would really like you to be encouraged and consider passing these teachings on. We want people to be benefited, so let's allow the Lord to do what he would like to do. But in the meantime, we're so glad that you've been join, joining us and enjoying these teachings. They will continue to come as the Lord tarries. But again, enjoy, enjoy the Lord. Thank you so much, and continue to pray for Calvary Chapel here in the city of Harupa Valley. God bless you, Pastor Greg, once again, and we'll catch up with you next time. Have a great week in the Lord. Bye now.